Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Kathleen Keenest, and I'm the gender advisor here at the United States Institute of Peace. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you to the Working Meeting of Strategies for Implementing 1325. Not quite a year ago, the Institute of Peace established the Gender and Peace Building Initiative with the objective to coordinate the Institute's gender-related work and to convene global leaders, practitioners, and researchers on innovative and significant analysis and practices to advance the understanding of a gender-sensitive lens in conflict and in peace building. I was tasked with this challenge, and in many ways, the task before me was made easier by the anticipation of the 10th anniversary of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. I realized quickly that a resolution on women, peace, and security was a critical framework in which to approach this new agenda. For those of you who may uh, be new to the resolution, in sum, 1325 recognizes that peace building and security are not just work of political and military leaders. It also asserts that women are essential to conflict solutions, that peace must be built from the perspectives, knowledge, and experiences of both men and women. We know that the exclusion of more than 50% of the population is an exclusion that uh, eliminates key and potential solutions to complex problems. With the leadership of our Executive Vice President, Tara Sonenshine, who you will meet in a minute, the enthusiasm of members of the Institute's Gender Working Group, many of them are here today, and the cogent perspective of my USIP colleague, Chantal de Jung Udrat, uh, who you'll meet shortly, we began building a cohesive network of partners. Taking us beyond our individual silos, our institutional missions. And so it is with great pleasure today that I recognize our partners today in this endeavor. They are the Department of State, Office of Global Women Issues, Ambassador Vivir, Jamila Bijou, Sharon Kotak, the Institute for Inclusive Security, uh, Jackie O'Neill and Evelyn Thornton, uh, Women in International S Security, Jolyn Schumacher, and my partner in this event today, Sanam Anderlini and her International Civil Society Action Network. Together as partners, we envision this working meeting as building a community of practice where governments and civil society are engaged in dialogue about the experiences and lessons learned in an effort to move beyond the talk and begin the walk of the 1325 over the next decade. Our community of practice today includes senior officials from the U.S. government representing the Department of Defense, State Department, USAID, Congress, foreign officials involved in implementing strategies of 1325, embassies, academic institutions, and NGOs. Among the countries represented here in the room today are Afghanistan, Canada, Finland, Montenegro, the Philippines, the Netherlands, Norway, Sierra Leone, and the United Kingdom. In addition to the 75 participants here, we have another 75, at least, I think there may be more, from around the world who will join the public part of the event in just a few minutes. Both participant lists are in your packet, and again, I hope uh, that you will take the opportunity to build on your social networks, your professional networks here. That is a key goal of this session. It is a working session, and we want to continue this dialogue because on November 4th, we are going to uh, co-sponsor with many of our partners here uh, a major international event, really celebrating 1325 and taking us into the next de decade. So with these opening remarks, I'm going to uh, turn the podium over to uh, Sanam Anderlini, who will give us the details of the day. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here on time and, and managing the traffic. 
Um, my name is Sana Mandralini from ICANN, the International Civil Society Network, and I want to echo Kathleen um, in thanking you for joining us today. It's wonderful to see the room full of such a diverse cross-section of the community of people working on um, promoting peace and security in the, uh, globally and, and in the world today. And I think it's a testament to the topic itself that it brings together women's rights and development NGOs together with Defense, Navy, USAID, the State Department, and others, and the Diplomatic Corps, um, because, frankly, none of us can do this work alone. But if we combine our strengths and comparative advantages, I think we can get quite far, in fact. Um, and I think this is the fundamental message of Security Council Resolution 1325. Um, I was involved in the early effort of getting it adopted, and what stayed with me over these last 10 years is that in countries affected by war and conflict, and we have people here from, from uh, countries affected by war and conflict, uh, women want their contributions to peacemaking to be counted and their commitment and their practical efforts to be supported on an equal footing with those of governments in the international community because basically it's a much more expedient way of doing sustainable peace. And, and over the course of the day we can talk about examples from many different areas where women have made these contributions. And the message is that they, they don't want to do it alone, but, we, but they want to do it together um, because it's, it is complicated. I think we can see it in Afghanistan today that, that these are complicated processes and we need all hands on deck, um, not, and, and to, to, cap, to address the issues and the groups that have a vested interest in war, we need to bring forward the, the groups that have a vested interest in peace. Their message reflected the reality of times and the changing nature of peacemaking um, that we were experiencing at the dawn of this century, but the resolution itself is probably a little bit of ahead, was actually probably a little bit ahead of the time of the institution that passed it, honestly. Um, and I think that might be one of the reasons why 10 years later we're still asking for implementation and wondering why women are being excluded from peace processes, whether it's Kabul or Sudan or elsewhere. Um, but one, one message I think that, that I'd like to convey is that for all the inertia and the challenges that we face, the fact is that if we didn't have that resolution 10 years ago, the conversations that we have today probably wouldn't be happening. Um, women would still be struggling to get themselves heard, but there wouldn't be a global movement that echoed their voices. Um, they'd have the right, obviously, but not, not the same legitimacy to make demands for their, for their governments. Um, and we'd have a lot less data about women in conflict, um, whether it's on security, sec uh, security sector reform, um, uh, refugee issues, governance issues. There's a huge amount of work that's been done over the last 10 years. Um, and finally, I can't resist the saying this, but the attention that we have brought to women and what happens to women has enabled and allowed us to talk about men also, men as victims of conflict as well, um, so, so, and, and their entire experience. So it, it, it really has opened up a whole new way of looking at, at, at these issues. Um, I wanted to say a few words about ICANN. We are a very small organization with a little hub in New York and Washington, but a great global network um, comprising of over 20 women's organizations uh, around the world, including the global network of women peace builders, and you'll hear from them today as well. And we see ourselves very much as a bridge, conveying what happens internationally to women on the ground and helping them use the material and the policies, at the same time bringing the voices of women to the international community through documentation and, and um, capacity building for policy, for, for policy work, uh, makers and, and institutions. And, and I'm delighted to be here today with USIP, the State Department, Inclusive Security, and uh, uh, Women in International Security. I think this is our first official public meeting, so thank you. Um, it's a little bit of a debut. Um, regarding uh, the, meet, the agenda and the materials in your packs, you'll find the agenda, the bios, the participant lists, a brief history of the resolution, a summary of its provisions, because we're not going to go through every, every element of it, and actually a summary of the total four resolutions that we have on women, peace, and security um, uh, that were passed in 2000, the additional three were passed in 2008 and 2009. Um, in terms of the actual day, we have a wonderful lineup of speakers and, and discussants. Our keynote session this morning and the morning panel itself will be webcast and will be public, uh, but after lunch, the session will be closed. I, I'm not sure what it means to say off the record or on the record, but um, you will not be quoted directly for, for, for anything that you say, but we want the sessions to be very much a working, interactive um, dialogue session. And then the last session of the day is actually a breakout group session um, so that people get a chance to really reflect and absor uh, having absorbed information maybe to reflect and discuss and help us think about kinds of recommendations that, that, that we want to make um, uh, that will also come out in a policy brief. Um, as Kathleen said, it is a working meeting, and I would like you to 
feel free to speak your mind and share, whether it's, it's your optimism, your skepticism, your confusions, your frustrations, um, enlightenment, good and bra- bad practice. This is, this is really a chance to put it on the table so that we actually can learn together and, and determine the next steps forward on this very important agenda um, in, in a collective and, and, and in a manner of co- collective and, and a state of sort of partnership and, and mutual respect. Um, Thank you very much. And I'm going to get back to Pat Kathleen, and we are one minute ahead of time. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Good morning. I'm Tara Sunshine, Executive Vice President here at the United States Institute of Peace. And I really want to begin by thanking Kathleen, ICANN, all the partners. If you would join me in just a round of applause for all the organizations. Um, It is not easy to get people around a common table, um, particularly today. I know some of you are without power. And as I was saying to Milan, um, it's a sort of funny expression because I can tell you that in this room, everyone has power. And um, we have common kinship and common missions and passions about seeing 1325 live up to everything it can be and should be and will be. At the end of the day, resolutions are about people. At the end of the day, pieces of paper and agreements and ideas and philosophies are only real when they're implemented and executed by human beings who believe in the power of other human beings to excel and to reach their potential. And that really is what today is about. Uh, My job is to tell you about two fabulous speakers that are going to keynote this morning, Ambassador Chaudhry and Ambassador Revere. Both bring years of experience and insight and direct knowledge of the issues that you'll be confronting over the next few hours. So let me begin by giving you a little bit about the bio of our first keynote speaker. Ambassador Chaudhry served Uh, from 2002 to 2007 as the Under Secretary General and High Representative of the United Nations, responsible for the most vulnerable countries of the world. And that is a pretty big task, I would say. His experiences go back to being a career diplomat, ambassador, and permanent rep of Bangladesh, to the United Nations in New York from 1996 to 2001. He also served as Bangladesh's ambassador to Chile, Nicaragua, Peru, and Venezuela, as well as Bangladesh's high commissioner to the Bahamas and Guyana. Now, if that were not enough experience, I could go on to tell you some of the things that I think really bring important bearing on today's discussion, which was his service as chairman and president of the UNICEF Executive Board in 1985 and 2000. And we all understand the unique challenges of women and girls, children in these vulnerable countries. Ambassador Chowdhury served as president of the UN Security Council for two terms in 2000 and 2001. And I think what's really most important for us today is his initiative in March 2000, while he was president of the Security Council, that initiative led to the adoption of the very groundbreaking 1325 that we talk about today in terms of the role of women in peace and security. And we thank him for having spearheaded really a pioneering initiative of the UN General Assembly in 1999 for the adoption of that landmark program of action on a culture of peace. And of course, what became the proclamation of the international decade for the culture of peace and nonviolence for children of the world, 2001 to 2010. He chaired the Administrative and Budgetary Committee of the UN General Assembly in 1977 and 1998, which means he understands money and resources, and was Vice President of the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations for two terms 
1997 and 1998. So I think all he has to do is say good morning and we're going to be impressed. Um, but I thank you and welcome you, Mr. Ambassador. I'm glad you could be here. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you, Ambassador Verbier, friends from the organizer organizations, uh, United States Institute of Peace, uh, International Civil Society Action Network, uh, Institute uh, for Integration of Women, and Institute for International Inclusive Security. Distinguished participants, I am most delighted to be here, and I am proud that uh, this subject is attracting your attention. Um, a little more than 10 years ago, on the International Women's Day in 2000, on behalf of the Security Council, as its president, I had the honor of issuing a statement that formally brought to global attention the unrecognized, underutilized, and undervalued contribution women have been making to preventing war, to building peace, and to engaging individuals and societies to live in harmony. The members of the Security Council recognized that peace is inextricably linked with equality between women and men and affirmed the equal access and full participation of women in power structures and their full involvement in all efforts for peace and security. It was unfortunate that the intrinsic role of women in peace and security had remained unrecognized since the creation of the United Nations. For a long time, there has been an impression of women as helpless victims of war and conflicts. Their role, the role of women in fostering peace in their communities and beyond has often been overlooked. That inex inexplicable silence of 55 long years was broken for the first time on the 8th of March 2000, thereby the seed of the Security Council Resolution 1325 was sown. If one looks into the relevance of contents, potential for change, and expected impact of any global declaration for women to stand out head and shoulder above all others, the Beijing Platform for Action and 1325 are unparalleled in terms of what they can do to empower women not only to give 50% of the world's population their due, but also to make the world a better place to live. Adoption of 1325 opened a much-awaited door of opportunity for women who have shown time and again that they bring a qualitative improvement in structuring peace and in post-conflict architecture. The main question is not to make war safe for women, but to structure the peace in a way that there is no recurrence of war and conflict. That is why women need to be at the peace tables. Women need to be involved in the decision-making and in peacekeeping teams, particularly as civilians, to make a real difference in transitioning from the cult of war to the culture of peace. I'm often asked how the concept behind 1325 came onto the Security Council agenda for the first time during Bangladesh's presidency of the Council. 
my conviction and determination to steer that initiative grew, if I may say so, out of my close and long-standing engagement with the international women's agenda. This agenda came up forcefully in my interaction of years with the NGOs, and this was something I felt needed a boost in the work of the Security Council, asserting, asserting the undeniable link between women's equality and peace. The dynamics of global war and security strategy as it was evolving in a post-Cold War world situation and the UN General Assembly's action to adopt a program of action on culture of peace that I also had the privilege of shepherding prepared the ground for raising the issue. At the beginning of March, when the Council's monthly work plan is submitted by its president, I had indicated my intention to proceed with this agenda. When I first brought women and peace and security as an issue into the Security Council, wide-ranging disinterest, even indifference, was expressed by my colleagues saying that the president was diluting the council's mandate by trying to bring in a soft issue on its agenda. The permanent five of the council resisted stubbornly through procedural and substantive maneuvers, expecting that this newcomer in the council, Bangladesh joined in only January, two months before the March presidency, will not be able to sustain its enthusiasm against this long-standing bastion of power. Conceptually, it seemed they decided not to connect women and peace and security. Also, I found that in general, ambassadors to the UN do not feel that women's issues are a top priority for them. Also, many of them do not get clear instructions in this form, uh, in this from their respective governments. Though the NGOs were drumming up support for some years for the linkage between women and peace and security, no country or its ambassador in the Security Council, even with changing composition every year, was ready to take leadership to initiate this issue in the Council. After I took that up, of course, it was a pleasure to get the collaborative support of some of my colleagues in the Council, in particular ambassadors of Jamaica and Namibia. I had originally hoped that the outcome of this initiative would be a Security Council resolution, but it turned out not to be possible in the time available due to objections by some high-profile member states. In that situation, we settled for a presidential statement which also remained elusive. Finally, I could coax all 15 to issue an agreed-upon press statement by the Security Council. This considerable resistance till the last moment to such a move could not be sustained when those countries found that I was very determined to push this through, threatening to issue a Council President's own press statement without the other members of the Council. It is only of this move that made them join in reconciling with the situation. To me and many others, the key element of 1325 is participation in which women can contribute to decision-making and ultimately help shape societies where violence against women is not the norm. 1325 marked the first time that such a proposition was recognized as an objective of the Council. Analysts are of the view that the passage of 1325 is an impressive step forward for women's equality agendas in contemporary security politics. However, they also believe that the historic and operational value of the resolution has as the first international policy mechanism that explicitly recognized the gendered nature of war and peace processes has been undercut 
by the disappointing record of its implementation. According to them, the poor record of the implementation of 1325 has fueled rather well-founded suspicions that the, the complicity of the Security Council in international practices that, that make women insecure, basically as a result of its support of the existing militarized interstate security arrangements. While some scholars point out that the language of 1325 is inherently flawed, others have highlighted its cost-free acceptance by the UN member states, wherein few have taken concrete steps to implement the provisions of the resolution. Analysts are of the opinion, and I agree with them, that 1325 is not an end, but the beginning of a process that will gradually help reduce gap inequalities. A gap in inequalities. Also, we should ha keep in mind that this does not necessarily indicate that the Security Council itself has internalized gender considerations into operational behavior. A major concern emerging from various studies is that the themes most frequently referenced in the country-specific resolution tend to refer to women as victims rather than as active agents in the peace-building process, such as in governance, peace negotiations, and post-conflict peace-building. It should realize that women are not just a vulnerable group. They are empowering as well. Those studies consider, and here again I agree strongly, that this point is crucial given its reactive versus proactive nature and because it suggests a critical weakness in the Security Council's commitment to key aspects of 1325. This weakness should serve as a lobbying point by women's, women's organizations, other NGOs, state actors, and civil society to maintain pressure on the Security Council to fully implement its stated commitments. Such hard-nosed analysis apart, my experience has shown that the participation of women in peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peacebuilding assures that their experiences, priorities, and solutions contribute to stability and inclusive governance. When women have been included in national peace negotiations, they often have brought the views of women to the discussions by ensuring that peace accords address demands for gentle gender equality and in new constitutional, judicial, and electoral structures. Such encouraging developments are to be seen in the work of, to name a few, the Mano Riva Women's Peace Network, a regional body based in West Africa, FemLink Pacific, another regional setup based in Fiji, mm -hmm. in the courageous efforts of women's and girls for women's and girls' education in Afghanistan, and in the organization like Swani Hans Inclusive Security. While we get encouraged by such efforts on the part of civil society, the role of the United Nations Secretariat, Secretary General in particular, remains much to be desired, to say the least. Not to speak of the need for his genuinely active, dedicated engagement in using the moral authority of the United Nations and the high office he occupies for the effective implementation of 1325. Even his pronouncements have referred to this landmark resolution in a cursory and non-substantive matter. On this year's International Women's Day, which his office curiously observed on 3rd of March, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon devoted one lonely sentence to 1325 in his rather long oration, claiming that he has made women's empowerment a priority of his administration. On the 
2000 and 2009 International Women's Day, he used his good judgment not to say anything at all on 1325. <laughs> so far, only about 19 countries have submitted their national actions plan for 1325 implementation. Why does not the Secretary General write to member states suggesting a date for submission of these plans in respect of their countries? Another area that deserves special attention is the need for the awareness, sensitivity, and training of senior officials within the United Nations system as a whole with regard to 1325. A matter of urgent attention is that in the name of peacekeeping, the sexual abuses which have been ignored, tolerated, and left unpunished for years by the UN cannot be acceptable in a civilized international community. Out of 450 cases of abuse, only 29 have been acted upon during 2007 and 2009. And 2010 report just came out last week, whereby 45 such cases were reported and only 13 have been acted upon. The UN leadership hides behind the proposition that it is the sovereign right of member states to try their peacekeepers. If the UN, through its tribunals and through the International Criminal Court, can put former or sitting heads of state on trial, then why not peacekeepers? The SRSGs, Secretary General Special Representatives, in each of the in charge of each of the 18 peacekeeping missions should be accountable for sexual violence and abuse committed by any peacekeeper in his or her jurisdiction. Also critical here is the role and contribution of civil society. At the global level, the United Nations Secretariat should not only make it a point to consult civil society, but at the same time such consultations should be open and transparent. During the 10th anniversary ministerial meeting of the Security Council this October, civil society should have a seat at the council table. These days, one rarely hears about the ARIA formula meetings of the council with the NGOs. As I conclude my presentation, I have the honor of launching my personal contribution to the effective implementation of 1325. It, sorry. it is the proposal entitled Doable First Track Indicators for Realizing the 1325 Promise into Reality. And this is my proposal. I hope copies will be made available to all of you. I'm launching it at this forum for the first time. This proposal outlines measures that, would be, that could be initiated without delaying any more and without prolonging our agony and frustration after 10 years of wait in expectation. I thank you again for your commitment to advocate and work for the full and effective implementation of 1325. When we raise our voice, only then things would happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for both a realistic and yet promising scene setter. And thank you also for reminding us, reminding us of the resistance and reluctance that you faced so that you steady us and sturdy us for the years in which I'm sure ahead we will still meet obstacles and challenges. So you've given us the, the courage and energy to move forth with you. On that note, I have the great personal and professional privilege to introduce our next speaker to you. And let me just say that many of us in this room and many of us who have worked hard and labor, labored and toiled in the fields of the women's space, the gender space, um, whatever space we've called it over the years, Many of us have taken our cue from Milan Verveer, and we have taken our cue from her, whether she was at Vital Voices 
or out at programs and seminars and conferences, whether she was with Mrs. Clinton. No matter where she went, we, we saw her, her light and took her leadership as an incentive to continue the efforts wherever we would each land in organizations, very mindful of her leadership. And now we really do celebrate the achievement of seeing her occupy a very important office in the Obama administration. And let me just give you a few of the biographical details to fill out um, her story. The President's decision to create a position of ambassador at large for global women's issues is unprecedented. And it does reflect the elevated importance of these issues to the President and to the administration. And to have Milan Revere in that position is to bring someone who has understood these issues as Director of the Office of Global Women's Issues. Milan is coordinating foreign policy issues and activities related to the advancement of women in the political sphere, the economic sphere, and the social and cultural dimensions of women. She mobilizes concrete support for women's rights and political and economic empowerment. And that comes through many of these initiatives and programs and trainings and collaborative activities designed to increase access for women and girls to education, to health care, to combat violence against women and girls in all forms, and to ensure that they are fully integrated with the human rights and development of U.S. foreign policy. Milan served as chair and co-CEO of Vital Voices Global Partnership, which we all know the international nonprofit that she co-founded that so invested and so began the investments in emerging women leaders to expand women's roles in generating economic opportunity and political participation. Prior to that, Ambassador Revere served as assistant to the president and chief of staff to the first lady in the Clinton administration and was chief assistant to then first lady Hillary Clinton in all those wide-ranging international activities going abroad advancing women's rights, furthering peace building, and safeguarding human rights. She led the effort to establish the President's Interagency Council on Women. We are extremely fortunate that she's here with us today, but most importantly, here with us on the journey ahead. So would you join me in welcoming Ambassador Revere? Good morning. Uh, thank you, Tara. That was uh, a little overboard, but uh, probably uh, the way to explain it is that we are good friends, and she is a former colleague uh, from the White House years uh, when she was on the National Security Council, and I so valued the work that she did then and continues to do today. It is a real personal pleasure and particular honor to be here today and to be here with Ambassador Chadre, uh, who has been and continues to be the spirit behind Security Council Resolution 1325. And when I heard him just minutes ago say that he was launching indicators that could help all of us as we continue to work on the full implementation of 1325, I said to myself, we really owe him a deep debt of gratitude, not just for his work in the past, but for that commitment that stays with him today and is a realization, an ongoing realization of the vision uh, that was uppermost in your mind 10 years ago. So thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. I also want to thank uh, USIP, uh, for all that it does to foster peace, and especially for the work of the Gender Working Group. To Kathleen, all of her colleagues here, uh, we too are in your debt uh, for all that happens here. And to the partners, where would we be without these organizations? You know, I sat here listening and thinking about uh, all the work that has been done over the years 
uh, looking out at this room and so many of you who have invested so much. Uh, and uh, we are grateful for what you do every single day. Although the importance of women's participation in conflict resolution, peace building, and post-conflict reconstruction is irrefutable, and although it's been 10 years since the Security Council in adopting 1325 unanimously acknowledged the intrinsic role of women in global peace and security, we all know that despite the progress and the speakers who preceded me outlined some of what has been achieved and we should take a great um, sense of satisfaction in that, but we know that we have a long journey ahead to see the blossoming of 1325 and all it represents, or none of us would be here this morning still struggling. It is also worth noting, as Ambassador Chadre did, that it was 15 years ago also at that UN Fourth World Conference in Beijing where 189 countries signed on to the Beijing Platform for Action that continues to be that ambitious blueprint against which we measure progress for women around the globe. And there in Beijing, they agreed to strengthen the participation of women in national reconciliation and reconstruction and to investigate and punish those who perpetuate violence against women in armed conflict. So in some ways, the Beijing de Declaration foreshadowed the action of the Security Council. Now, we know that under the Charter of the United Nations, the Security Council bears primary responsibility for maintaining international peace and security. And so with their action on 1325, the international community was linking the role of women to peace and security. So we mark these two anniversaries, 10 years for 1325, 15 years for Beijing. And as Ambassador Chaudhry and I were talking before we walked in here this morning, it is often the anniversaries that provide special momentum. Mm -hmm. I believe that, and I believe this is a time for us to grow the kind of progress on this issue we all want to see, a time for us to redouble our efforts to ensure that decision makers recognize and once and for all take seriously the essential role that women must play if conflicts are to be resolved and peace is to be sustained. And we in the United States government are accelerating our efforts as well. We know that around the world, the places that are the most dangerous for women also pose the greatest threats to international peace and security. We also know that today's conflicts increasingly take a toll on civilians, mostly women and children. And sexual violence, particularly rape, is being used as a weapon of war, as a purposeful strategy and impunity is widespread. Women must be active participants during the peace process and its aftermath. But for too many in positions of power, there is still a lack of recognition of why women matter to peace and security. I remember being in a discussion some months ago with an official on why women should be at the negotiating table. And he looked at me as though I had just fallen from Mars. <laughs> and he said, I just don't get what you're saying. He said, women are not part of the armed combatants. They're not from their governments for the most part. Why should they be in peace negotiations? And I agree with Ambassador Chaudhry. Women are too often seen solely as victims and not as the agents of change whose perspectives and participation is so critical 
in peacemaking and peace building. A woman in Afghanistan some months ago said to me something I've not forgotten since I left uh, that evening in Kabul. We were in a discussion, and she started her opening words by saying, please do not look at us as victims, but look at us as the leaders that we are. We are still looking at women far too frequently and solely as victims, and they often are. There is no doubt about the fact that the violations against them have to be redressed but they are also leaders in ways that will take us to a different place in the kind of world we all want to see. The United States has strongly supported the Security Council's actions on these issues. Inspired by 1325, the U.S. took the lead in the adoption of two subsequent resolutions, 1820 and 1888, which focused on ending sexual violence in conflicts and ending impunity. We know that there is a clear link between maintaining international peace and security and preventing and responding to sexual violence as a tactic of war. After the Secretary's trip to Eastern DRC some months ago, and meetings there with government officials, peacekeepers, refugees, and certainly women in the active NGO community. Secretary Clinton saw firsthand the urgent need for greater efforts to address the sexual violence against women. And she argued before the Security Council for the adoption of Resolution 1888, to improve the United Nations response to sexual violence committed during armed conflict. And as we all know, the Secretary General appointed Margot Wallström as his special representative now on sexual violence and conflict. And we are working, as so many of you, with the United Nations and her so that it will have the capacity to deploy a team of experts to help governments strengthen the rule of law, improve accountability, and end impunity much before these intractable conflicts occur to prevent them from occurring. President Obama's national security strategy recognizes, and I quote, countries are more peaceful and prosperous when women are accorded full and equal rights and opportunities. When those rights and opportunities are denied, countries often lag behind. Furthermore, women and girls often disproportionately bear the burden of crises and conflict. Therefore, the United States is working with regional and international organizations to prevent violence against women and girls, especially in conflict zones and supporting women's equal access to justice and their participation in the political processes. And as Secretary Clinton has often said, women's rights and women's issues cannot be an afterthought in our foreign policy. They must factor centrally in how we look at the world. We have made women a cornerstone of our foreign policy not only because we think it's the right thing to do, but because it is the smart thing to do. And as Ambassador Chaudhry said, there is nothing soft about these issues. And for far too often, when you inject women into any of the issues, they are perceived to be soft. They are among the hardest, most complex challenges we have to confront, and we cannot do that successfully writing off half the population of the world and all of the talent and experience that it represents. Let me focus on Afghanistan for a bit because it is an immediate uh, situation before all of us. And I am personally thrilled uh, that Pawasha Hassan is here today. 
She most recently comes uh, just days ago from the Kabul conference uh, where we all worked hard to ensure that the voice of women uh, would be heard in that ministerial gathering of some 70 uh, leaders. And she has played a long role. And I know as the discussions evolve throughout the course of the day, the perspective that she brings will be particularly useful uh, to me, certainly, but certainly to all of you as well. As the uh, international, at the international conference that took place earlier this year uh, in London, Sen- Secretary Clinton emphasized at that meeting that women need to be involved every step of the way in the process of building Afghanistan's future. And she introduced the Women's Action Plan, which is incorporated into the United States, Afghanistan, and Pakistan Regional Stabilization Strategy. The plan, as she said, includes initiatives focused on women's security, leadership in the public and private sector, access to judicial institutions, education, health services, and ability to take advantage of economic opportunities. It was a, is and was a comprehensive, forward-looking agenda. She also emphasized that the role that was being discussed about the future reintegration and reconciliation process be one in which women are fully participatory. And to make a point of that, the women who were present in London from civil society in Afghanistan, again, a negotiation process, Uh, to enable them to be engaged in that conference. She took them with her to the press conference that she did shortly uh, after the meeting ended to make the point, to introduce them and make the point that their role was absolutely vital to what was being discussed uh, by the ministers at that meeting in London. And the United States worked to ensure the participation of at least Uh, 20% women in the consultative peace jirga that took place in Kabul on June 2nd, as well as in follow-on shuras and consultations at all levels. And this will continue to be absolutely critical. At the request of the women leaders, working with many of you in this room, uh, we provided assistance so that the women in Afghanistan who were leading this process could become as effective as they could be uh, in developing strategic plan that they could put forward in the discussions ahead. And at the Peace Jirga, which wound up with about 23% of the participants being women, uh, we heard, uh, in fact, some of the women came to, in to see us after that Peace Jirga, And they told us what it was like uh, to be in the working groups confronting some of the conservative uh, mullahs or the traditional uh, tribal leaders and to be able to put the issues of concern to them, which were also about the future of the country, on the table, face to face. And they felt, because their numbers (laughs) were greater than they often have been, uh, that they were able to really make progress. And in fact, President Karzai noted some weeks later uh, that it was very gratifying to see that the women had been accepted. Now, this said, it is also true that some of the women who, a few of them, who were very, very outspoken going into the peace jirga, had their invitations withdrawn uh, to participation. But all of that said, it was a progressive step, uh, and we can hear more from Paul Washa in the hours to come uh, about the, the, the beginning processes and what uh, impact it had. Now, just days ago, literally, the Kabul conference took place uh, It was co-hosted by the United Nations and the government of Afghanistan, uh, a gathering of international leaders to launch the Kabul process. 
their government's commitment to ensuring greater accountability. And in the Afghan-led strategy to improve development, governance, and security for the Afghan people. Prior to the meeting of the leaders, just minutes before, Secretary Clinton sat down with a group of women leaders in Afghanistan. She had with her Lady Ashton uh, from the European Union, and she was to have had uh, the foreign minister of Denmark who was detained, but together they had agreed that it would be extremely useful and send a very strong signal uh, to have the gathering just preceding the Kabul conference with many of the Afghan women leaders. And they listened to their concerns about the reconciliation and reintegration process. And Secretary Clinton recognized their heroic work in strengthening their communities and their country, uh, work that really needed to go on in the critical days ahead. And she reiterated the United States' commitment to ensuring that the women would be engaged in all aspects of the process and Afghanistan's development. She also reiterated that in the discussions on reintegration uh, and reconciliation, that on the parts of those with whom reintegration would take place, there had to be a complete uh, renouncement of violence of al-Qaeda and a commitment to the Constitution specifically spelling out that that represented uh, women's equality. And what does that mean, lest there be any doubt that other way, others could interpret women's equality differently? It meant the right of women and girls to go to school, to participate in government and business, uh, to have a life free from violence in their homes, workplaces, and communities, and so on. Later, during her intervention in the Kabul conference, leaving the meeting with the women, the Secretary of State reiterated, and I quote, I want to emphasize the importance of President Karzai's recent statement that the rights of women, Afghan ethnic groups, and civil society will not be sacrificed in pursuit of reintegration and reconciliation. Over many years, I have observed and participated in post-conflict reconciliation efforts in the Balkans, in Northern Ireland, in Africa, in Latin America, and I speak from my own experiences when I say that the work of Afghan women and civil society groups will be essential to this country's success. If these groups are fully empowered to help build a just and lasting peace, they will help to do so. But if they are silenced and pushed to the margins of Afghan society, the prospects for peace and justice will be subverted. And she went on to announce several new development programs to support the efforts of women in Afghanistan. And of course, these programs don't just strengthen and support the women and their families, but it makes a huge difference for everybody in the society and how they will benefit. The initiatives and commitments that have been launched in Afghanistan most recently and have been made over the last many, many, many months reflect the ongoing commitment also to 1325 because they include training women at local levels to build their capacity to take on leadership roles. It includes training of female parliamentarians and provincial council members, and there is an election coming up of parliamentarians. There are some 400-plus women already registered to run for office, mostly in the Kabul area, but it is something that is going to prove to be extremely vital in the months ahead. And the role of the women's ministry and others who are active in government is absolutely essential, and continuing efforts for training and capacity building are in process. 
working with men and women in law enforcement and in the judicial system to diminish the impunity that allows threats, intimidation, violence to continue, particularly to women in public life, and training female police officers and women working in the justice sector, engaging religious leaders and local officials to promote women's political participation. I would also like to touch very briefly on Iraq uh, to say that we continue to be deeply committed to empowering Iraqi women in all sectors of the society there. Uh, in the interest of time, I will just say that in this time there, a uh, time of transition uh, that is taking place as uh, our own presence, military presence, winds down, uh, it is even more critical that we ensure that women are able to take their place uh, in the political life of Iraq. We have had delegations of women coming through uh, who are active in public life, and they too, as we have heard over and over in these situations, uh, continue to stress the need uh, for capacity building, for efforts to be made to ensure that they will be full participants. Let me just turn uh, very quickly uh, to a, a recent uh, effort that we have made, uh, one in which uh, Secretary Clinton has been deeply engaged, which is that several weeks ago uh, she sent a cable to all U.S. embassies and missions urging their support to accelerate U.S. implementation of the four Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security. The cable provides strategies for implementation, urging U.S. embassies to utilize the full range of diplomatic, defense, and development tools to advance this agenda. The cable requests embassies to provide a description of significant actions and programs related to women, peace, and security in the cable, uh, reinforcing with governments that these are actions our embassies can take, reinforcing with governments that women need to be included at the negotiating table and be full and equal participants in peace building, advocating to include issues of concern to women and families in these peace and recon reconstruction efforts, meeting with women's organizations, particularly in countries af affected by conflict, to hear their views and raise their concerns with their governments, identifying and training key women leaders by arranging uh, capacity building opportunities for them, encouraging governments to increase the number of female military and police personnel that they contribute to UN or regional peacekeeping operations, uh, working with governments of countries in conflict as well as the humanitarian actors so that they can take special measures protect, to protect women and girls from from sexual violence. And I could go on and on, I won't, but it gives you a flavor of the kinds of things that uh, we are working concretely uh, to ensure that take place around the globe to further peace and security through the agency of women. Let me just conclude in saying that uh, the United States efforts are directed to respecting women's rights, to safeguarding them from sexual violence in armed conflicts, and to recognizing the critical role that women can and must play in peace and security. In other words, to fully implement what was the vision and continues to be the vision of 1325. <laughs> and to paraphrase, paraphrase that woman activist in Afghanistan, we need to look at women not as victims, but as the leaders that they can and must be if we are to bring about an end to conflicts and to truly create sustainable peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Vivir, Ambassador Chaudhry. I think you have really laid 
the groundwork for this day uh, working meeting. You've given us very concrete examples from your proposal to doable fast track indicators for turning 1325 promise into reality and uh, the cable that has just been sent to the embassies. These are the kind of uh, examples that I'm sure we're going to continue to exchange today, but these really set the bar high. We need the bar set high, and we will uh, take on these challenges. So thank you very much. I want to uh, take a few moments and just explain the next part of our uh, program today. We're going to take a very brief break. That means five minutes just to get up. It's not as cold as it was, so <laughs> you don't have to move around so much. And then we're going to come back to our second session of the morning. And that session uh, will really be uh, about more uh, uh, applications of 1325. What is the state of play today from various uh, experts who have been working with 1325 for many years? So thank you for a great session. Please uh, join me in thanking um, Ambassador Chaudhry and Vivir again. And we'll see you back in five minutes.